taught for a long time that we couldn't change the land. The soil was what it was. We couldn't change organic matter. We couldn't change it significantly in a, in a human lifetime. Um, and, and we don't believe that any longer. With the things that we know now about organisms in the soil and adding livestock and diversity, we can make pretty significant changes in just, in just a few years on the land. By using our type of management, we get twice as many animal days per acre as somebody that's continuous grazing. If everybody that had pasture got twice as many grazing days, what would that do to our ability to produce beef? It would double it. We don't need more grain, we need better management on the land. Well, how did it start? Doug, did you get the idea to change the management? Or did Steve, did you get the idea? Doug did. <laughs> does that mean I take the blame? Yeah, through, through work and things that I read, you know, about grazing management, you know, just started into a basic rotation system and then that kind of morphed into all the things that we do today. What are you two Billy Bobs doing? Huh? So this is a farm that I bought in 2000 and we set it up in a rotational grazing system with 16 pastures. And we rotated through it in about 30 days, 35 days, which is a fairly quick rotation, what I would consider it as management intensive grazing or MIG grazing. And one time, about three or four years after I bought this place, the water tank was broken. And I was, I was too lazy to fix it or didn't have the parts, I don't remember which. So instead of grazing this field, we rotated the cows on out to the next paddock and went around the entire farm. So this paddock essentially got a double rest period. So instead of the normal 35 day rest period, 40 day rest period, it got a 70 or 80 day rest period. So when I came back into it the next time, it had a lot of lignified tall material. And I knew if I turned the cows in and gave them the whole field, that they would, that they would waste a lot of it, or so I thought it was called waste. They wouldn't eat it. So I brought a poly wire in and we essentially strip grazed it off and, and trampled and ate most of it. And you know, I thought, man, that was just a mess. That whole field was a mess, right? The next year, this field produced twice as much forage as, as any other paddock on the place. And so that, that was kind of an aha moment for me. I, I didn't really understand what happened, but, but I understood that that tall, mature forage, if it was trampled down, would, would do some incredibly good things for the soil. We tried to use a, a, a grazing method that emulates the native herds of bison and elk and even antelope. There are accounts of uh, bison herds in, in the hundreds of thousands, and there would be nothing left, no vegetation behind them because they trampled or ate all of it. The grazing method was a heavy, severe grazing and a very long, extended rest period. We do that by by using electric fence, by concentrating the animals in an area to emulate that trampling effect of the bison. The biggest cost in any grazing operation is the land itself. So if the land is my biggest cost and I can get twice as many animal days per acre out of it, it's essentially like I, like I bought two farms for the same price. So, so it decreases my land cost in half. Is it saving money now or is it just costing money in different ways the way you're doing it now with rotational? No, oh, it's saving money. It's, I mean, you know, you've got the grass too where you don't have to, you know, do your, using your fertilizer and stuff. You're sa you are saving money. Now, does it take some labor? Does it take a little fence? Does it take uh, some water? Absolutely. But we have no cost that a lot of other people have. Um, we have no fertilizer that we add. We have very little machinery that we use. Uh, we don't bush hog, we don't bale any hay, so we have no hay equipment. So our cost of production is drastically less than somebody that's continuous grazing during the summer and then feeding hay during the winter. It's really a pretty good business. Um, you know, I sell, I sell water and sunshine. This little area right here that I'm standing in is a little, uh, a little remnant of some native prairie. 
And you can see by how, how productive these grasses are that they really adapted to this climate, to the heat and the humidity and the moisture regime that we have here in Missouri. Warm season grasses are about, from a moisture efficiency standpoint, twice as efficient as cool season grasses. They actually have a different metabolic pathway that allows them to conserve moisture on hot days. They actually close up and, and don't respire during the day, so they, they conserve moisture. Um, they can be grazed out very quickly. That's a lot of the reason why there's not much prairie around. Besides the fact they plowed a lot of it up, a lot of it was just overgrazed uh, and, and killed out. This is big blue stem. One of, the, one of the primary grasses of the tall grass prairie. It has a tremendous root system. It probably has three times the root system of the introduced cool season grasses. Here's a cool season grass plant and here's a warm season grass plant. We're gonna get three times the growth out of this warm season than we will the cool season. Three times the tonnage, three times the carrying capacity. As technology became available in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, equipment got bigger and people adopted technology and began to use all that stuff because before that it was hoeing things by hand to get rid of weeds and it was putting up hay with a sigh and stacking it by hand. So it was really hard. So once, once technology and equipment and, and, and fertilizer and chemicals came along, boy, they, they adopted it really quickly. But it wasn't until just a few years ago that we began to realize the effects on the land, the effects on us, the effects on our animals that really cause problems long term on the land. The big baler was invented by Mr. Vermeer up in Iowa back in the early 70s. Um, since then, big bales and haying has been adopted by livestock producers very, very rapidly to the point where it's so easy because of equipment, it allows them to do literally hundreds of acres a day. Um, here we've got a, a shot of last year's hay that didn't get used right along with this year's hay. They're baling hay that they don't even need simply because it's easy. From a soil health standpoint, haying is incredibly damaging to the land. Not only does it remove the nutrients, which we've known about for a long time, but it also removes the, the roof and the cover, the habitat, the food source for all the organisms in the soil. So, so here we are in a, in a hay field that's been, that's just be recently been hayed. If we, look, if we look at the area right here, you know, you can see there's a lot of bare dirt. There's no thatch on the surface of the soil. So we're not capturing sunshine. We've got bare soil right here that's not only getting hot, but we're wasting an opportunity to, to capture sunlight and grow more plant material. Um, and this just is very indicative of a, of a field that's hayed year after year after year. We used to, several years ago, bale our own hay. And I was doing my taxes and I looked at my expenses for the year. You know, and I, and I looked at my number one expense was my hay expense. The fuel, the, the, the cost of the machinery, the repairs, the time it took away from my family. So for me, you know, it came down to simple math. You know, I looked at it, I said, okay, this is, this is how much it's gonna cost me to bale hay. And I knew if I ran enough extra cows on the land that I was baling hay on, I could more than pay for the hay that I would have to buy. And, and not have to spend the time or the fuel or degrade my own land in the, in the process. You know, we don't provide any kind of warmer for any of these cattle. We feel with our rotation and keeping the forage taller, we eliminate all of the, the parasite issues. Most of the parasites live in the bottom portion of the canopy where it's cooler and wetter down close to the soil. So by grazing it taller, uh, we stay away from them. And also by having a much longer rotation. You know, there hadn't been any cattle in this, in this particular pasture for probably, probably 80 days, 70 or 80 days, 90 days. So uh, hopefully most of the cycle of those parasites has been broken. 
most of the wormers that are used are, are very uh, detrimental to, to organisms in the soil, to dung beetles. Uh, but it's more than just the dung beetles, it's the pollinators, it's the whole ecosystem. So by eliminating that, that's just one more step that we've taken to try to make for a healthier ecosystem. Money saved. Cha-ching. For several generations now, we've been transferring our wealth in the form of food to the urban areas. We need to bring that back out here. You know, only 17% of every consumer food dollar goes back to the farmer. 83% of that consumer's food dollar is in the shipping and the processing and the transfer. So you think about that. Of all the food that we produce out here, what if I could direct market 50% of my production and bring a big portion of that 83% back to my rural community? It would mean more jobs, it would mean more families going to school, it would mean more teachers in the school. It gives us a way to bring more dollars back into our community and to our pocket. It also gives us a way to restore this land. I just made that change and just went on and don't even think about it now, just do it. Would you go back? No, no, uh -uh. I'd stay this way. It's not just about the soil, it's about the climate, it's about the environment, it's about the economics in our local communities. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get up in the morning and I'm going to put my pants on and I'm going to put my shirt on and I'm going to say bye to my wife and kids and I'm going to go out and I'm going to talk about soil health to people. And I'm going to go home and I'm going to get up the next day and I'm going to do it again. Um, and if I, can, if I can reach somebody every day, then we'll, we'll eventually get there. We will eventually get there. Um, how long it's going to take, I don't know. And that's the honest truth. There's two kinds of plants. Plants the cows eat and plants the cows don't eat and they pretty much eat everything. So 